Anybody else feel like we already had church in this place? Yeah, yeah. Great day, great day. I'm so excited just to be able to share today with you. And you know, they tell me uh, that this is supposed to be like my last time to preach or whatever, but what you probably don't know is I'm a lot harder to get rid of than that. So you'll be seeing me again. But hey, if you don't know me, my name's Kevin, and God has uh, called me to go pastor Black Hawk Ministries, a church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And so I am excited to be able to just follow God's leadership and be sent from home because this is home. Midway is home. And so I'm excited to be able to share. Thank you. Midway is home for us. Georgia is home for us, and I am really excited and humbled and honored that Todd gave me this opportunity to get to preach uh, before we go out there one more time uh, to you. And so we're in a series of messages called Multiply, Multiply, Growing Disciples. And so we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 4 today. Get your Bibles out. I'm really, really pumped to share this scripture with you because this has been one of my favorite scriptures all of my life, particularly the last several months as God's been stirring and and doing a lot of new things in my life and in my ministry. Uh, But it also fits this series perfectly because today we're going to look at the heart of a disciple maker. The heart of a disciple maker. We're in the fourth week of this series. Last week we looked at uh, this, this journey of how disciples grow. If you were here last week, you saw Pastor Todd go from platform to platform and take those steps upward. And that's what God's called us to do is to take steps forward in our growth with him. And I'll tell you this, though. If you want to know how not to grow the heart of a disciple maker, if you want to know how not to grow as a disciple, it's make sure your heart gets out of tune with the heart of Jesus, Have you ever been in that place in your life where you just feel like your heartbeat and the heartbeat of God were two totally different things? And so today we're going to look at that heartbeat, and I I love that because it's also going to give me the opportunity to share one of my favorite scriptures with you, and I'll also share a little bit more about my story. A few weeks ago on, on August the 7th, I told you I would share more with you. I had a lot more I wanted to say. Well, today I get to say all those things uh, to you and just share with you a little bit more about my journey and all God's done uh, through this scripture and through just God remolding and remaking and reshaping my own heart, and he wants to do the same in your life. Anybody ready to get shaped a little bit today? So let's join him together. First Peter chapter 4, we're going to look at this, this concept of the heart of a disciple maker. And, and let me just ask you, do you ever find it difficult to maintain a heart for making disciples? It's hard to keep that heart and that mindset, if we're honest, isn't it? Because the world is filled with all these things that steal our heart. The world is filled with all these things that, that steal our mindset and our time and our attention. And our heart ends up beating for all of the things that go maybe even contrary to the things that God's heart beats for. And so today we're going to look at how we can just maybe resync our hearts with the heart of Jesus The Bible has a lot to say about our hearts. In fact, Jeremiah 17, you can just jot this down, Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, it's going to be on the screen for you as well. The heart is deceitful, it says. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Is anybody with me on that one? That's that's my heart so many times. It's so deceitful. It deceives me. It pulls me in all the wrong directions at times because I'm just human and so are you. But then I love Proverbs 4, verse 23. It's going to be on the screen for you as well. And it says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So how is it that we have a true heart of a disciple maker? How can we have a heart that looks like the disciple making heart that Jesus had? And I want to go on and give you the bottom line and what I think 1 Peter chapter 4 and the answer to that question really is, and it's this, that the heart of a disciple maker is one that is in sync with the heart of Jesus. The heart of a disciple maker is one that is in sync with the heart of Jesus. If our heart looks like the heart of Jesus, we'll be doing okay, won't we? And you know, here's the thing, as impossible as that may sound to you today, It's possible because all things are possible through Christ, and he wants to remold you and shape you in ways that, here's the thing, where disciple-making becomes something not just that you do. A lot of times making disciples, we love hearing a sermon series on it. We love going to life group once a week and talking about it. We love hearing a sermon or sitting in rows like this and thinking about 
a disciple-making mindset. But here's the thing. God wants disciple-making not to be something you do on the weekend. God wants disciple-making to be who you are. It needs to be something that flows from the inside of us and comes out in a way that we can't contain because Jesus and his heartbeat and passion has become our own and has consumed us in ways that only the gospel can do. And so today in 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to look at that kind of thing. Put your hand over your heart for a minute and just talk to your heart for a minute. You ever talk to your heart? Probably haven't. We're going to today. I want you just to say to your heart, say, heart, it's time for a makeover. And that's what we're going to do today. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. I want to give you five things from these five verses. We're going to look at 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. There's five verses we'll read, and there's five things that I think gives us a great glimpse at the heart of a disciple maker. So who's ready for the word this morning? Start in verse 7. The first thing you'll see is, is a seeing heart. Take that down if you're taking notes. Write that down. A seeing heart, a heart that sees. Let's look at verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Interesting verse, isn't it? Be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Have you ever been so unclearly-minded and lacked self-control so much that you felt it even impossible to pray? Has life ever gotten so confusing, so weird, so difficult, so challenging, so chaotic that you even found it hard to pray? One of my favorite verses is Romans 8, 28. It tells us that all things work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. But before that, that's where we find some scripture that gives us some insight on what to do in times where we don't even feel like we can pray. Romans 8, verse 26 says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for. Can I get an amen? (laughs) But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, even when we don't see what God is up to, even when life gets so confusing and chaotic that we don't even have words to pray. The heart of a disciple maker, the heart of one that's truly pursuing Jesus, the Spirit of God prays on your behalf. And when he does, you start to see things his way. You start to see things in the way that God sees things. And can I give you a confession, a pastoral confession today? In this season of my life and ministry, the timing of this transition in my own life, God's calling to call me away from something that's very comfortable, something that I love and enjoy, calling me away from home. In this season of my life, right after we've lost a dear friend and our executive pastor, Rex Pear, and now seeing the struggles. Pastor Todd, by the way, is, has just left and is going to see Dan Hall, our interim executive pastor, lead executive pastor. Uh, some of you have read about his struggles, just a, a crazy freak accident type of, of struggle, health struggle that he's facing right now. And my confession is, it's pretty confusing to me. I know you're like, oh man, we came to hear a pastor. He was supposed to make things less confusing. It's confusing to me too. Life gets really weird and confusing sometimes. I don't understand. I don't see all of the things that I know God sees right now. I don't. And it's confusing. It's frustrating in a lot of ways. But hear me. But hear me. And you're like, man, I thought we were going to get encouraged, right? This is the encouraging part. Here's what I do know. In those times where I see the least, where I see God the least, in those times where life feels the most confusing, Every time I've entered a season like that in my life, I can only speak from experience, but I guess your experience is probably pretty similar. Every time I've entered one of those seasons of my life, but looked for God, he's done some of the most amazing things in my life that he will ever do. When you find God the least around you, he's probably working the most. So keep your chin up, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And I remember the best story that, I don't know, characterizes my life with that more than ever. It was 2005, and I was going on my first overseas mission trip to Uruguay. Jessica, my wife, who's in here with us now, she went with me. We were on the plane, and I'm that guy. If you've ever been on a mission trip with Pastor Todd, he, he can go out like a light on a plane. 
He'll have those headphones on, and he's not here, so I can talk about him for a minute. And he'll, he'll lean that head back, the mouth goes open, and <laughs> he sleeps most of the way. I can't do that. My goodness, I've tried to take medication, and I've tried everything to sleep on a plane. I can't sleep on a plane, and it's frustrating. So we had this big, long, I think 10-hour flight, and Jessica was sleeping beside me. And I remember I looked out my window. I was in the window seat, and I looked down, and it was one of those sights that you can only see from a plane. You know what I'm talking about if you've flown. It was, it was a storm. I remember seeing the storm, and it was, it was rough looking. It was dark. I could see the thunder and the lightning from way up above, but it was pretty small. It looked like something I could hold like this. But I could see it, and it was just dark and thunder and lightning. But then up above it, I saw the sun. The sun was coming up. It was, I guess, morning time. I didn't even know I'd taken so much medication. I was loopy but still couldn't sleep. And I wasn't making it up, okay, because I woke her up, and she saw it too. (laughs) But I remember the sun. It was that moment where you see the white fluffy clouds and the beams of light just shooting everywhere, those beautiful moments. And I kid you not, there was a rainbow that just looked like it connected from those white fluffy clouds where the sun is all the way down to those storm clouds. I will never forget that. It's like God spoke to my soul Hear me. And I think he wants to say the same thing to you today. He's like, it's like God spoke to me and said, Kevin, there are going to be times in your life where all you'll be able to see is the cloud. You will only see the storms, the lightning, and the thunder, and the darkness around you. But remember, I'm the God of the storm. I'm the God above the storm. I'm the God that sees the rainbows, sees the rays of sunlight, that sees all of the things that you can't see when you're consumed by the cloud. That's the seeing kind of heart that the heart of a disciple maker has, realizes that God sees things that we will never be able to see, or maybe we'll only not be able to see for a season. But either way, I'm glad he sees it. I'm glad that we can have a seeing heart, a heart that sees like he does in our own lives as well. And so for you today, let your seeing heart lead you to the second thing here. When you see as God sees, your heart's going to go through another little season that I like to call a stretching season. That's the second thing. Write down a stretchy heart, a stretchy heart. And I know you say, what a a cheesy way of putting it. I know, but you're going to remember it this week. You're going to remember that I've got to have a stretchy kind of heart. Look at verse 8 with me of of 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse number 8, we move on from where he says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so you can pray. Verse 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Aren't you glad we have access to that kind of a love? But here's the thing. If we're to love one another deeply with that kind of love, if it covers, have you ever made a list of your sins? It's a multi, I love the word multitude because there's a multitude of sins that looking at me in the mirror every morning when I get up. You probably can identify. So if love is going to cover a multitude of sins, that means it's going to have to stretch It's going to have to be a lot bigger capacity of love than I can offer. But that's the kind of love of the Savior that we serve. And so I want to challenge you today to have a stretchy kind of heart. We're talking about the heart of a disciple maker. And this week when God's stretching, you're going to remember Pastor Kevin standing up here with that weird little stretchy pillow and talking about having a stretchy heart. Because some of you right now, you feel like God's stretching your heart. I, I can identify. I feel stretched in so many ways in this season of my life. But here's the thing. God wants to stretch you. Some of your heart feel like this sometimes, like it's just going to burst. It's almost like God's just pulling it so hard, like I can't let it get pulled any farther. God stretches us. And, you know, you often hear people say this statement, well, God will never put more on you than you can handle. Have you ever heard of that? Let me tell you something. Some of you have tried to live your life by that. It's been confusing to you. It's not in the Bible. That's why. And, and some of you are still looking at me like, yes, it is. I, I think my grandmother showed me. Let me tell you what they're referencing. They're referencing the scripture that says you will never be tempted beyond what you are able. You will never be tempted beyond what you can bear. What that means is you will never be tempted. You'll never face struggles in your life that your God is not bigger than those struggles. The power within you is not bigger than those struggles. But here's what I have found. God will often stretch your heart so much that it is way more than I can handle. God will often stretch your heart so much to where the only place you can look is up. But it's in those moments where when all we can do is look up that we see God in ways we could never see him again. Without us being in that kind of a place of stretching, we could never see God the way he intends for us to see him 
And it's in those moments of stretching that, yes, it's more than you can handle, but God will often let you get into those places where, yes, it's way more than you can handle, so you have to see how well he can handle the things you can't begin to handle. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to stretch your heart. Write this down if you're taking notes. A heart that sees as God sees will always stretch. A heart that sees as God sees will always stretch. God, help me see as you see, so I'll do as you say. Try to live by that. Help me see as you see, so I'll do as you say. I don't really do very well following Jesus when I don't look at life the way he looks at life. Help me see as you see, so I can do as you, as you say. And we sing a song, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. A lot of times my heart breaks for things that really doesn't break the heart of God, and my heart is hardened to the things that truly break the heart of God. If we're honest, we can all identify with that, but I want my heart to break for the things that breaks the heart of God. I want my heart to beat for the things that God is passionate about because my heart will steer, steer me wrong and steer me in directions that I don't need to go. So I want to tell you, I told you I'd tell you a little more about our story. This season for Jessica and I and our family has been one of these seasons, a stretching season for us. And one of the ways God speaks to us is through repetition. You know what I'm talking about, those, those kind of those, a scripture verse or a person or a theme or a principle from scripture that you really just assume not hear about anymore at times, but it just keeps coming up in front of you. You know, in those devotions that are completely random, it just gets sent to your inbox, and it's like, there it is again. My goodness, God, what are you trying to tell me? It's been like that for a long time with us, and one of those verses for us is Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. In those verses, God says, behold, he says, forget the things of the past, don't hold on to those, but here's the part that God's just kept right in front of us. Behold, I will do something new. I will do something new, and it's like, okay. New car, new, but I, you know, what does that mean? But increasingly over the, the months, it's like God said, I'm going to do something new that's going to require you to stretch. It's going to require you to be a little bit uncomfortable. I will do something new. The next part of the verse says, will you not perceive it? You know, we, we hear that and we're like, will you not see it? Well, I'll see it when it comes, <laughs> right? No, that word, So it's, it's been such a repetitive thing in our life. I looked that up, and that word really doesn't just mean, will you not see it? It does mean that, but it means, will you not see it and then embrace it and own it and let it penetrate your heart and become a part of who you are? That's a lot easier said than done, isn't it? And here's what I want to tell you. As I tell you a little more about our story, I want you to reflect on your story too, because here's what I know, because Scripture promises that God wants to do something new in your life today too. Because he's making all things new. He's made you new. If you have a relationship with Jesus, will you not perceive it? Will you not own it? Will you not embrace it? Will you not let those new things that God wants to do in your life penetrate your heart in ways that changes your life? That's what God's been asking us for several months now. Pastor Todd's been gracious has walked through that with me. I didn't know what all it meant. I kind of felt like an Abraham journey. I felt like, you know, God said, Abraham, hey, go to the land it's like, and I'm sure he was like, to the land. Okay, what land? Go to the land that I'll show you. He just said, go. I'm not really going to tell you much about it yet. Be willing to stretch. Be willing to step out of your comfort zone, and then I'll make things clear as you go. I don't really like that approach because it just feels like this. But God just stretches and grows, and that's what happened in our life. And as we became willing to stretch and grow, said, Lord, the answer is yes. Now what's the question? Again, we like to say, God, tell me the question, and then I'll get back to you on Monday with my answer. <laughs> no, that's not the here I am, send me mindset. So as Jessica and I developed that, God started to make things clear through things as obscure as, as just a simple Facebook posting of a sermon that this group had reached out to us about a college ministry. And I said, no, hey, we've got a great college pastor. I did that for a while. No offense to the college students. Like, that's not me, right? A long time ago, that same group called us back out of the blue Nothing that we were looking for, and here we are. And then God started to align things and put pieces in place that we just knew. This is, this is that new, isn't it? Maybe, no, it's not. Surely it's not. No, it is. And God made it clear, and he stretched us, and we grew. And I want you to know, when we do that as a church, when we do that as the church, because who's the church? 
I am the church. You are the church. When we do that as the church, when we say, God, here I am, send me, stretch me, mold me, make me into who you want to be, your best days are always yet to come. And even when it means getting into a place that's uncomfortable, even when it means taking action steps that you're afraid of, God's going to bless you in ways that only he can bless you, ways that you can't achieve on your own as you have a stretchy kind of heart. So let's look at the third thing, not just a seeing heart, a stretchy kind of a heart, but a heart that serves, a serving heart. Look there with me at verse number 9, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 9. He says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, verse 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Give me your best grumble. Mm. Without grumbling. I love that Jesus had a serving heart. He said, I didn't come to be served but to serve. He washed the feet of his disciples. He was the greatest servant among, all, among everybody he was around but he was the son of God. We're called to have a serving heart, and we're to offer hospitality. I love that we have a great hospitality team, a great first impressions team. We call it all these different things, but we want to host people at Midway. If you're a guest here, my guess is that you were spoken to at least four or five times before you got into the worship center. If not, then we really dropped a ball because that is a heartbeat and a passion of ours because the loudest sermons, hear me, those of you who serve in the parking lot, a lot of lanyards in the room right now, those of you who are out there sweating, Alan Spells is out there. You've seen him, big Alan, that just threw Brian in the chair a few minutes ago. He's out there waving at you. I want you to know that sermon is the loudest sermon many of you have ever heard. You hear what's said in here based on what you experience out there. Why? It's scriptural. Offer hospitality to one another. We're supposed to be an open-handed, open-armed church just like Jesus was. And let me encourage you and tell you thank you for something, a little teaching moment for you as you continue into your future. Usually when there's a transition, I've been a part of a few of these, leaving one church, going to another. Usually people ask a certain question. Many of you probably thought it, but I want to commend you for something that I'll get to in a minute. The question is, well, what really happened? <laughs> you know, and you start doing that in your head, like, what really happened? Give me the good stuff, the real story. Let me tell you, I'm humbled by this because it just shows us what kind of church you're a part of, that we're a part of. Not one person has shown my family anything but support and love over the last couple of weeks, and not one person has asked us that question. Celebrate that and thank each other for being the church. Without grumbling, without looking for something wrong. Now, hey, when somebody asks you, hey, what's the real story? Why did Kevin really leave? Say he had a stretchy heart. He told us the real story, and it was just a God story where God was stretching him and growing him, and he's doing the same with us, and he's doing the same with you. Hey, how's God stretching your heart lately? That's how you respond, because you've heard the real story, and it's the story of stretchiness. It's the story of stretching our hearts into what God has for us, and so I challenge you and commend you for that and challenge you to keep that mindset up. Flip back, save your place in 1 Peter 4, if you will, but flip back to Hebrews chapter 3, just a few pages in your Bible. 10, 12 pages probably. Hebrews chapter 3. I want to read verses 12 and 13 when it comes to the serving heart. Because here's the thing. I've gotten to lead our life group ministry here at Midway uh, for a number of years. And, man, we've just seen God just multiply when it comes to this series, multiply and do some amazing things through our life groups. We've seen our life groups grow like crazy, and it's because of you. It's because shepherds like you have stepped up to the plate and led the way for Jesus. Because you have the heart of a disciple maker and I love this passage because I want to challenge you on my way out the door, at least for a see you later for a little while, see you later on. I want to challenge you. I want to, here's what I want to do. I want to talk to those of you who are life group leaders, those of you who are in a life group, and those of you who are not in a life group. And in case your, your mind's a little behind and you can't do that math, that's everybody in the room. I want to talk to you for a minute about how much you need community. I want to give you a challenge to make sure you're in a place where you can find community. Where you, and what is, what is community? Well, it's described very well here. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. 
Who would do that? Who would have a sinful, unbelieving heart that would turn away from the living God? Anybody else want to join me and be honest? Okay. Why would we do that? Well, I think this scripture gives us a good insight to how we can combat that. So, see to it, brothers, that none of you has that. Well, how? How do we do that? Verse 13. But encourage one another daily. How long? Daily. Not once a week in your life group gathering. Not once a week when you sit in rows here in the church. Encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. So, how long? Well, there's going to be a new today every day that we breathe. So, guess what? This is a daily, ongoing activity for us. So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Have you ever deceived yourself? We just read that verse in Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart's deceitful above all things, right? Who can even understand it? There's no answer to it. Well, here's a good answer to it. Be in community. See to it, brothers. I love that. See, what does that mean? It means you guys need to see about each other. It means you need to see about what's going on in your brother's life. But here's the thing. What we're doing now in this building, sitting in rows, is biblical. It's important. It's a vital part of your growth as a Christian. Hear me when I say that. But also hear me when I say, but it is not enough to walk out the faith that you have in Jesus. It's a starting place. And that's why we believe so heavily in life groups, in being in community together. And I want to challenge you with this scripture. And by the way, it says encourage. That word encourage doesn't mean like, hey, I see you once a week, so keep it up, buddy. That's enough. You've gotten that pat on the back. And it's nice, but it doesn't really help you when life happens, does it? What the author here is talking about here in Hebrews is this word encourage, and it means a lot more. It means to appeal to. It means to exhort. It means to urge strongly. And it even means to beg. You need to be in a place where somebody has the ability to speak into your life. Hear me. To speak into your life where they need to exhort you, urge you strongly. That's a lot more than keep it up, buddy. And urge you strongly and even to beg and plead with you to see things God's way sometimes. What does that mean? It means you need to be all up in each other's business. Some of you are like, hey, pastor said it. I've been waiting for that moment. No, there's ungodly ways of doing that too. Don't even go misquoting me this week. Because here's the thing. Scripture makes it clear what that's supposed to look like. It's the truth in love. But it takes us being willing to serve one another and to be served enough where we put ourselves in the place of vulnerability to let others speak into our life. That's one of the best ways you can develop the heart of a disciple maker. And when you think about that very subject, when you think about that very thought, I want, to, I want to tell you this. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Some of you are going to disagree with me, but I think we all need it. And I am the chief among sinners, as Paul said. I don't like community. There, I said it, all right? I wasn't going to say it, but there I just did. I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. I don't like people being able to speak into my life. I don't like it. I'd rather just do it my way and everybody leave me alone. But that's not God's way. I believe this statement the best defense we have against self-deceit is community. The best defense we have against self-deceit is community. The answer to that internal drifting of the heart comes from external community. The answer to the internal drifting of our hearts starts with external community. That's why God instituted the church and said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Why? Because we're going to be so linked together with a serving heart, serving one another, speaking into one another's lives in a way where we stand when everything around us is falling. That's what a serving heart can look like and can do in your life. A row really can't know. When you look at your neighbor right beside you, you don't really know that person. Unless you live with them, then you might. But as you look down your row, you really don't know what they're facing. I try to be mindful of that every time I preach. I don't know what you're going through. I know some of you are here with a very heavy heart today. It doesn't just feel like this. It feels like this. You just feel like it's just been beaten up and bruised. But we're here to serve one another with a serving heart and to love through those times together. That's what the church is called to do. That's what the church is supposed to look like. Jesus put it this way, John 13, 34 through 35. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. 
as I have loved you, not as you can love each other because we don't have much capacity in our hearts, as I have loved you, you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. A serving heart. Let me give you the fourth thing. It's a steward's heart, verse number 10. Verse number 10, we see a steward's heart. And I've often said, this is my favorite leadership verse in all of Scripture. When it comes to leadership, when it comes to leading, and you may say, well, good, I'm not a leader. I would argue and say, yes, you are. You lead something. Somebody's looking to you for some reason in your life. So this is really one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. Look there with me, verse number 10 of 1 Peter 4. Flip back if you're in Hebrews still. Verse number 10, each one should use whatever gift he's received to what? Serve. There's that serving heart again. To serve others. This is my favorite part, though. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. A lot of versions read, as a faithful steward of God's grace. Now, first of all, you guys talk back to me for a minute. What's a steward? What does that mean? If I'm a steward, I'm a, a manager, really. It means that I take something that's not mine and I take care of it. And just so you know, your kids, if you're a parent, they're not yours. God created them. You're a manager of those kids. God's entrusted them to you. That money that's in your bank account, it's not your money. It's his money. He owns everything. If he wants to take it away, he can take it away. If he wants to give you more, he'll give you more. You may say, I wish he would, but it's all his, bottom line. We get to steward. We get to manage. We get to care for the stuff that God gives to us. And here's one thing I know because one of the things that I've battled with through this season of my life and through all of my life, honestly, is I don't feel very equipped, really, in my life. I don't feel like I have much to offer. Some of you can identify with me. You say, I just don't have what it takes. I want to tell you something. I'm, I'm a firm believer in the statement, God doesn't call the equipped, but he always equips the called. That's who I am. I'm the shy kid who was never supposed to do public speaking, It's not because I'm equipped, it's because God called me and God equips those he calls. But here's my favorite part about this verse. I hope you hear me. This is why this is my favorite verse. If you think you're not very well equipped today, how about knowing that you're equipped and you get to manage the grace of God that saves souls from the sin that separates us from an eternal God? Do you feel equipped now? You have The grace of God that saves your soul in the palm of your hand, so much so that God says, you go be a steward of that grace. You hold it, you care for it, you administer it, you give it out. Do you feel equipped yet? You thought you didn't have much to offer. How about the grace of God? We get to offer that to the world, and God not only just says, I'm going to give it to you in a way that saves your soul, but I want you to manage it and go give it out. Wow. I'm so unworthy of that kind of grace. Who am I to be a steward of the grace of God? Yet God says, go be a steward. You want a heart of a disciple maker. Be a good steward. Hold God's grace in your hand, his love, his mercy, his salvation, his hope, his meaning, his purpose. Hold it in your hand and give it out freely and be a good steward of it, putting it before everything else you could do in your life. That's the heart of a disciple maker, a steward's heart. And so with you, what's one area right now that maybe God's asking you to be a better steward with? It might be your money. We often think of money when we say steward, but it's so much deeper than that. This verse shows us that more than anything else. How could you be a better steward this week of your family, of your time? Be a better servant to your wife, men. Be a better servant to your husband, ladies, to serve your children and be a steward of the leadership and the influence that you've been given in your family, in your friends, in your workplace, in your world. What does that look like for you to have a steward's heart? Look at verse 11 with me, and this is what it boils down to. Verse 11 The fifth thing, and the fifth verse we're reading today is the heart of Jesus. Write that down, the heart of Jesus. Here's what I want you to know. I'm going to let you off the hook, but then I'm going to hook you back. I'm going to let you off the hook by saying your heart is not good enough to have the kind of heart that we read about in this scripture. It's just not. So now you can go, good. I'm glad he sees that too. 
But here's where you're back on the hook. The heart of Jesus is more than enough to overcome all of your deficiencies, all of your inadequacies. It's his heart in us and through us that gives us the capacity and the ability and the strength to be Jesus in the lives of other people. You don't have what it takes, but he does. And he never falls short. Look at verse 11. If anyone speaks, anybody planning to do that this week? Just checking. All right, this verse applies to you then. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. It's the heart of Jesus that gives you what it takes to have the heart of a disciple maker, not yours. But when you know Jesus, you have his very heart. Remember that original question, is it ever difficult to maintain the heart of a disciple maker? Well, of course it is because our heart doesn't have the capacity for that. But when we give our heart over to him and let him stretch and grow and call us to do and to be all he's asked us to be, it's his heart in us that consumes us in a way that takes over every aspect of our life, how we see, how we stretch, how we serve, how we steward, it gets consumed by the heart of Jesus. And God's glory becomes our goal instead of our own goals being our goal. It's his glory that takes the cake. And so I want to ask you a question. What disciple-making assignment, what disciple-making assignment has God given to you today as he's shaped your heart? You say, well, I don't, you tell me, what is it? I don't know. You do. You know what it is. You may have a list of 20. I just want to ask you to zoom in on one for a minute. And if you don't know, then I want you to take a moment and just ask, because he'll gladly tell you. He's got an assignment for you that's going to change your, your week, but it's going to go deeper than changing your week. It's going to change your life this week. And I want to challenge you. I was thinking this week and just praying over, what would my parting words be? There's a lot of scriptures that, that say that, but I just want to tell you a few things as you ponder that question I want to challenge you to do a few things. Number one, fix your eyes on Jesus, Midway Church. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and finisher of your faith. Follow your leadership as they follow him. We're blessed with some amazing leadership in Pastor Todd Wright and the other pastors and leaders here at Midway and in your leadership. And I've already commended you for ways I've seen that over the last several weeks. Follow your leadership as you fix your eyes together on Jesus and follow him because this is his church And he is building it, and even the gates of hell can't prevail against it. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Follow your leadership, starting with him, and then your leadership here at Midway Church. And then number three, make disciples. Make disciples. Now back to that question. What's that one assignment that will help you do just that, to make disciples? I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes and think about that for a moment. I'm going to give you a moment just to pray over it. In just a moment, we're going to sing that same song. I love the song that we've gotten to sing today about mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over everything. But I love the end of the song where it says, you're making all things beautiful, even your old deceitful heart. You remember you put your hand over your heart and you said, hey, it's time for a makeover? Even that old deceitful heart, God's making beautiful. In a moment, we're going to sing that together, and I want to give you a time just to commit and pray. But some of you don't know Jesus today. The most important thing, all heads bowed, all eyes closed, I just want to speak to you you say, I just don't know that I have that personal relationship with Jesus, my heart really hasn't been laid down at at his feet and given over to him. I still own it. It's still about me in my life, and I just don't know I would have an eternal home in heaven because of a relationship with Jesus, but I'd like to. The gospel is just simply good news. It's news because it happened. Jesus already died. Jesus already rose from the dead. Jesus already paid the price for your sin, that price you could never pay. He already lived the sinless life that you and I could never live. His grace is already sufficient for you. And some of you need to just embrace that. Scripture says anyone, anyone, yes, that includes you, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Some of you need to take that step, and I don't need to lead you in a prayer because your heart is already screaming it. The gospel is as simple as as letting God know, hey, I know I need you. I know you died for me. I know you're alive. And 
instead of this life being mine, I lay it at your feet. It's yours. I give you all of me. Would you just take a moment and do that if you don't know Jesus? And just let him have your life, every bit of you. I believe somebody in this room has taken that eternal step today. You may not have even come here thinking today would be that kind of a day, but God did something in your heart and you just cried out to him and gave your life to him. Nobody's looking around. I just want to give you a moment to acknowledge that before him and before me. And I just want to pray for you. Nobody's going to do anything else. I want to give you some instruction about what you can do to keep moving forward. But I just want to pray for you. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? Say, pray for me. I gave my life to Jesus today. I laid it at his feet. Anybody, raise your hand for just a moment. God bless you. Who else? Lift it, lift it high. Anybody else? I see you. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? God, thank you for that. Thank you for saving souls. Who's here and would say that assignment question I asked? You've got one. A really important assignment that God's given you today. Would you slip your hand up? Let me pray for you too. All over the building. Keep it up for a moment. Awesome. Awesome. Put your hands down. Jesus, you're alive, you're well. Thank you for saving souls. Thank you for giving us assignments that are gonna change the world as we have a heart of a disciple maker that really is just in sync with your heart. Lord, as we stand and sing in a moment, we sing about your mercy. I pray we would use this as a time of commitment. I pray that people would fill out the card they received as just a, an example of their commitment to you. I pray people would fill the altar, would fill the aisles, would fill their seats with prayers and with hitting our knees together, just committing to being a disciple-making Christian, a disciple-making church, because we're just simply a disciple, one who's following after Jesus, one who's being changed by Jesus, and one that's committed to your mission and not our own. And I thank you for what you're going to continue to do in our hearts and lives in this place. Pray this in the matchless, holy, powerful name of Jesus. And everybody said, will you stand to your feet for just a moment? We're going to sing this song. As we do, I'm just going to come join you down here, and I'm just going to spend a minute praying, committing to being that kind of a disciple-making Christian. And I want to ask you just to come and pray with me, pray in your seats, fill out the card. If you prayed to receive Jesus, you can bring that forward to me at this time. You can take a minute to fill it out, but use this time as a moment to commit to him as we sing. Will you join me?